little fundamental review of your electrolytes. Um, you're going to have to know potassium upside down and inside out for this exam, okay? Um, because you're going to, you're, not you, the patient is going to experience hypokalemia during the allegoric stage of AKI. Also, post transplant, it's like the kidney gets so excited, it just starts putting out a ton of urine. So, that's one of the electrolyte. Um, disorders you need to watch for post transplant because the nurses and the nurse is going to have to in both AKI oligarch and um, transplant when they're diuresing you got to keep up with that fluid because you have to replace the fluid based on their urine output all right so let's talk about hypokalemia just remember everything's a little low and slow so they could be uh, slow to empty their bladder they could have hypotension um, lethargy. Um, they could either be tachycardic or bradycardic with a low potassium. Remember, the heart likes a Goldilocks level of potassium. They like the potassium to be in that 3.5 to 5 category um, when we're talking about normal values. Um, so when it's not, you know, the heart doesn't like that and it will let you know. So on the ECG for hypokalemia, you're going to see a U wave. Um, you could see PVCs. And if your patient develops any of these symptoms, get an EKG, okay? Remember, uh, you know, you always gather all the information you need for the S-bar before you reach out to a physician. And remember, in NCLEX, you have all the orders you need, okay? So you don't have to uh, worry about not having an order. All right, so this is just what I was telling you before. Um, with hypokalemia, you could get that U-wave. The, everything gets like really droopy, okay? And um, then watch for VTAC and VFib. Okay, both hypokalemia and hyperkalemia, okay, can result in first degree block, which is the PR interval greater than 0.2 seconds in VTAC or VFib. Okay, so remember with VTAC, you're going to check your LOC and vitals first. Make sure, and if they have a pulse and they're stable, you call the provider. And if they have a pulse and unstable, you're going to do unsynchronized cardioversion. And no pulse, unresponsive, you need to defibrillate. Okay, those are the nursing interventions for that. Now, with hyperkalemia, um, this is a potassium, uh, this says 5.5, but I start to worry if it's above 5, just saying. Um you're going to see, you know, some of the same signs and symptoms, but they have like ascending paralysis. It's like Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so they could, the, their respirations could get very low. Um, in terms of their heart rate, they're going to, not heart rate, ECG, you're going to see peak T waves. Um, you're going to see the widened QRS, the pre, P, prolonged PR interval. Um, the patient's going to get bradycardic, they're going to have a systole, and then they'll die, okay? So you need to be able to recognize this early and, um, you know, treat it. So you can remember the mnemonic kind for the medications to treat a high potassium. So K is for K-exalate, which we call polystyrene uh, sulfonate. It is... Um, it helps re remove potassium from the bowel, okay? Now, don't get this confused with lactulose, which we, lactulose is for the liver, k is for the kidney. However, renal encephalopathy is not treated with k -exalate. Only the high potassium is treated with k, -K okay? Um, the reason people have renal en encephalopathy is because there's like 130 nitrogenous um, waste products floating around in their system, okay? So it's not like in with the liver we could say, yes, the ammonia is causing the confusion and somnolence and your, your neuro, neurotoxic signs. We can't say that with the kidney. It's a lot of different things going into it. And so if somebody has a high potassium... Um, and they're, they're confused, they're acidotic, 
the treatment is going to be dialysis, kidney replacement um, therapy, okay? So let me go back to kind. So KXLA, I is for insulin, and we give that with D50 or D, you know, some sugar solution, okay? Um, N, sodium bicarb, and D, dialysis, okay? So and now the other medication that can be given is calcium gluconate. Now, calcium gluconate doesn't necessarily um, lower the potassium, but it does protect the heart from the, it antagonizes the effects of potassium on the heart. All right, so we'll look for that. Um, murder, your EKG changes. Also, you, the other thing you have to remember is that um, patients that have kidney disorders get put on ACE inhibitors early in their disease process. And I know you normally think of ACE inhibitors as lowering the blood pressure, but one of the reasons that they get put on an ACE inhibitor is to um, block protein loss in the urine, okay? So it helps the kidneys, um, you know, minimizes protein loss in the urine, okay? So that protects the kidneys. And so, but the thing about ACE inhibitors or ARBs that you have to remember um, is that they can slightly increase the potassium. So you have to watch your oligoric patients, especially on ACE inhibitors, to make sure the potassium doesn't go so high. All right, so you're going to have to know the treatments and how to recognize. Okay, now with calcium, <coughs> so in this unit three, exam three, you have got um, oncological emergencies where you might see hypercalcemia but you also have renal failure or a chronic kidney disease where you, or oligarch phase, AKI, where you might see hypocalcemia. So let's review, okay? So hypercalcemia acts as a sedative to your body, okay? So it's gonna slow everything down. So I, I remember, I like, um, Thrones, bones, stones, moans, and psychiatric overtones. So for thrones, they're going to have decreased bowel sounds. All right. They're going to have constipation because everything has slowed down except for the kidneys. They're going to have polyuria. Okay. It's the hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia creates like a nephrotoxic diabetes insipidus in the distal tubule. Um, so just remember constipation, polyuria, so that's why they're on the thrones all the time and decreased bowel sounds. Um, bones are for fractures. People with hypercalcemia are going to be prone to fractures. Stones is for renal calculi. You had that med surge one. Moans is for muscle weakness, diminished uh, DTRs, and clots. Um, it decreases clotting times because calcium makes clots. So um, it's needed in, the, in the, um, the pathways to make clots, okay? Psychiatric overtones. So patient with hypercalcemia is going to have apathy and be like depressed and slow. Um, a flat affect, if you, sort of. Okay, cardiac, short QT and cardiac arrest, which isn't good. All right, so the treatments is going to be IV fluid for like, remember saline is a good flushing fluid. So intravenous fluid, you're definitely going to do that. They may give loops. Um, they may get put on like zoledronic acid um, or Fosamax. Um, they may get um, dialysis. Okay, that's another thing that they could, they could do. Um, hypocalcemia, on the other hand, Okay, you know about positive Chavox text, positive Trasios, periorbital tingling or circumoral tingling, hyperactive DVT. So if calcium is a sedative, when the calcium is low, everything is spastic. Okay, tetany, strider, um, they're going to have increased or prolonged clotting times because calcium is in the intrinsic, um, in the pathways 
to make clots in um, they're going to have a prolonged QT. Now, I have this in here about how calcium helps with clotting. You don't need to memorize it. You don't really need to know it. All you need, to, all, all I'm trying to illustrate here is that calcium is involved in clotting. So if you don't have enough calcium, your body is not going to clot and the patient is going to be at risk for bleeding, which is not a good thing because one of your goals with renal failure, because people with renal failure have hypocalcemia, one of your goals is that the patient doesn't bleed, right? Because they're more prone to bleeding because they have chronic kidney disease. Um, so patients with low calcium are going to be um, prone to bleeding as well. All right. So that's potassium, um, calcium. And then also um, bone pain and fractures are prevalent in both high and low calcium. And then I have another calcium down here. You might like this better. Okay, so hypercalcemia. Okay, this is, you can see this in, um, in cancer patients. It's usually late. What you have to pick up on, especially if somebody um, has like um, multiple myeloma, they would be prone to this. Breast cancer is prone to to um, this. Um, you don't have to really understand which cancers. Um, but anyways, your treatment, you're going to treat whatever's causing it. You want the patient to get up and walk if possible. Um, patients with uh, bone meds sometimes are in a lot of pain and can't do that. Um, hydration, so IV fluid at a high rate, IV fluids at a high rate. Um, I talked about the zolidronate and um, also Fosamax, what is the other name for that? I can't think of it right now, but it may cause an, in, those drugs may cause intrarenal AKI, so watch out for that. So your, your signs and symptoms, okay? Remember your stones. Remember, your patient is going to have polyuria and constipation. For some reason, students all, always forget about the polyuria. I think when I say, you know, calcium is like a sedative, they think that um, they think that the urine should be slow, but they have polyuria. They put out copious amounts of urine. Groans. Okay, so groans, they can have um, peptic ulcers and pancreatitis with hypercalcemia. Uh, abdominal pain, but as you know, it's not that common for hypercalcemia. It's not one of the two most common ways to get pancreatitis. All right, bones. Um, so they could have bone pain, bone fracture, muscular weakness, psychiatric overtones. They are really down, really flat, apathetic, depressed, uh, can go into a coma. And then cardiac wise, they're going to have uh, a short QT arrhythmias, uh, hypertension, cardiac arrest. Those are the, what we're watching out for.